at the same time. It's the hardest if you go about it the wrong way. That's all there is to it. And, it's, and I say hardest, but it's not even that hard. It's just hard, like harder compared to the other ones. All right. For a question like this one, you want to change your perspective. Because we define a definite integral as the net area of a region bounded by a function and an appropriate axis. Thing is, we've been talking about that appropriate axis being the x-axis. So the question would become, well, what if it's the y-axis? Can Will it still work? The answer is yes. All right. If I were to do something like this, if I were to say find the definite integral from 0 to 2 of x squared minus 1 dx, what it's going to do, and I'm, I'm going to sketch this out, but then I'm going to erase it immediately. It's going to figure out this area and this area. All right, so some of which you want, some of which you don't want. You could work with that. You create rectangles. I mean, you have a big rectangle here whose area is equal to 6. So if you find this piece, subtract it from 6, and you'll have all this stuff. And then you would already have this one if you go from 0 to 1, negate it. But you're looking at two integrals, two separate integrals, and an area of a rectangle. That's, that's more than we want. All right, so we don't want that. What I want to do is change the orientation of the graph. All right? I want to look at it differently. And in fact, I want to look at it sideways from the perspective of the x axis, uh, y axis. So the reality is, I'm only looking at it like this because that's the only way I can physically actually look at it from the side. The way I really want to be looking at it is like this. Well, I can kind of see it. So negative 1, positive 3, right? And then you're going from 0 to 2 here, all right? Can you see that? Yeah, kind of. All right? So you're turning your head to the side, but then looking from the back of the paper to the front. So not overly practical, because during a test, I, I can't have 33 people holding their test papers up to a light just to see what the graph would look like, all right? Because you're holding it up to the light to see what the graph would look like, but the five people around you are looking up to your paper to see what the answer to question two was. All right, so that, that's the issue there. I disagree. What's that? I disagree. Oh, oh, I knew you would. I knew you would. Uh, my experience tells me that people just can't help themselves. I found myself yesterday, we were, we were doing a, um, it was a seminar at the high school, they call it wellness day, and it was like different workshops throughout the day. So I was in charge of bringing, well, me and two other teachers were in charge of bringing some students around the school and, and sitting in on different seminars. And one of them was just talking about like whether the United States is a meritocracy. And we were supposed to create a list of internal and external factors. And I swear, like they, they said, take two minutes and come up with a list of internal and external factors. And they started the clock. I swear, the first thing I did was I looked at like three other people's papers. Like I've been teaching for 20 years. Like my biggest pet peeve is cheating and I could not stop myself. Because I had no idea what an internal or external factor was. My first instinct was like, I don't know what this is. What do you got? Like, it's, in a lot of ways, it's just human nature, All right? So, so, yeah, during a test, if I tell you to put your paper down on your desk, it's not because I think you're cheating, it's because I think the people around you just can't, they, they won't be able to control themselves. And worse, they might even write, like, you write an incorrect answer, it's like complete gibberish, they might even be writing that down, like, oh, this is good stuff, I'm like, oh, no, it's not, it's not, it's not even remotely good, it's terrible, don't write that, write this instead. So what we want to do, because we have a function that contains its entire area between the y-axis, but that function is defined in terms of x. I want it to be defined in terms of y. All right. It goes back to rectangular approximation. 
right? The Riemann, the magical Riemann sum I keep th uh, talking about. If I were to draw an arbitrary rectangle on this interval, that rectangle would have a thickness in the y direction, poor quality y, let me fix that. And it would have a length of x. All right, which would give me an area of that single rectangle that one rectangle has an area equal to x dy. Bless you. So what I want is infinitely many of those on the interval of negative 1 to 3. The way I account for that is by saying that I want the antiderivative on the interval of negative 1 to 3 of some function x. Now that function x would be of y, dy. So this is the function, x as a function of y. And x as a result of the y input, that's all that means, fancy language. So if I can set that integral up, I'll have everything I need because wherever I put this rectangle, in this interval, it'll be only separated by the axis and the curve. All right, we'll be in good shape. All right, so that leaves me with that function. Y equals X squared minus one. So I'm gonna take that and solve it for X in terms of Y. So I'm gonna add one to both sides. Y plus one equals X squared. I'm gonna take the square root of both sides. X is equal to, normally it's plus or minus the square root of y plus one. However, I'm on the right-hand side of the y-axis. So I only want the positive, all right? Right of the y-axis is your positive x values. Above the x-axis is your positive y values. I might have said that backwards. Positive x values to the right of the y-axis positive y values above the x-axis. All right, so my final answer on the interval of negative one to three would be the square root of y plus one dy. All right, now eight, nine, 10, they're all similar. I'll, I'll bring it back in, zoom in in, in a second, but uh, 8, 9, and 10 are all of a similar variety of the, to the stuff on the previous page, so you should be able to handle that now if you, if you had trouble with it. 11 is along the lines of, uh, of 7. So if you struggle with that one, now you have a, a fighting chance. So on this page, that's where I'm going to leave it because what's the point of doing all these other problems if you haven't had a, you know, a chance to really succeed with it? The idea is that if you have a good, strong foundation with areas, then volumes are not as challenging, right? So we spend time, and one thing I know I said is the foundational stuff, you know, the, the beginning of this course. If you get a good handle on it, then the stuff that comes down the line will never be as challenging as it could be, right? So it, I find, as a teacher and as a student, uh, specifically as a teacher, because that's more fresh, but when I gloss over a foundational topic, it's like holy hell later on in the course trying to get people to understand the more complicated stuff. It's like, how do you not understand this? And then I look back and I'm like, ah, that's because I didn't teach you like key fundamental components, all right? So, and, and some of you, especially if this is your second go around with the course, you, you know what I'm talking about, all right? So for number eight, the idea again, uh, with areas specifically, and being able to kind of fluently bounce back and forth between areas and volumes is, a, is kind of a big deal. So if you can do that and keep everything straight, then you're, you're moving in the right direction. So we have a single function here on that interval. And the only thing that you're really assessing here is whether or not that single function traps the bounded area in its entirety between itself and an axis. All right, the idea is that it can be n axis. We would love it to be the x axis in most cases, 
but will settle for the y-axis. But it has to be trapped completely within the between the function and the and n axis. All right, and that happens here. So that tells me that I can get away with writing a single integral to represent this area. All right, so it's going to be an integral going from zero to four. Now, part of it's below the x-axis, all right? So negative has to become positive. So absolute value, 3x minus x squared dx. Much more challenging if you had to do it by hand. I mean, not the act of integrating, but the act of setting it up. And I, I say much more challenging. Uh, you'd have to write two integrals, two separate integrals. You'd have to consider which part is negative in order to make that part positive. And then integrate drop whatever negatives you have, and then add only positive values together. But because you're allowed to use a calculator, you just slap an absolute value around the function and, and call it a day, all right? Now, visually, and it's not always necessary to really consider this, but it's a good idea to try, at least try. You know, on a test, would you do it this way? Probably not. You have the part, the part that's positive stays positive, the part that's negative is going to become positive. All right. So when I'm finding, and I'm kind of covering up the graph, uh, the equation itself, but it's not really that important anymore. When I'm finding the absolute value of a function and the integral of that absolute value, that what I, the thing I just shaded in blue, that's what I'm finding the area of. All you care about is whether that area is equivalent to the area that you're looking for. All right? If it is, then you did what you needed to do. All right? Worst case scenario, it says find the actual area. All right? Pop it in your calculator and be done with it. All right? All right so I'm, I'm going to hop to number 10 because it's pretty much the same problem. <laughs> I get uh, catch a lot of grief for my lack of creativity when it comes to uh, developing questions, uh, but that's probably a good thing because if I'm not overly creative, then you don't need to expect too much variety when it comes to questions that I might put on a test. All right, so I'm pretty much an open book when it comes to that. All right, I'm not big on trick questions. That's not to say that you might not get tricked by a question, but it's not by my design. I don't purposely put trick questions on tests figure the material is tricky enough as it is. All right, so this one would be on the interval of zero to three. We have the absolute value of the function four minus x squared dx. All right, I just jumped right to that because I mean, if you compare the graphs for numbers eight and 10, I mean, with slight variation, they're pretty much the same thing. All right, so at least they have the same characteristics. Part of it's above the x-axis, part of it's below the x-axis, bounded by a single function. Uh, it's the best possible situation. I had, I had some pretty nice teachers, but some of my friends did not when I was going through the process. And I would have a question like this on my test. It's like, oh, it's not bad. My friends would have a question like this, but it would say, find the area in terms of y, All right? So this graph, but then they would have to find the area using a dy instead of a dx. That just became 10 times harder. I'm like, ah, you did not get lucky. Then there was, not, there was no ratemyprofessor.com back then. There was no avoiding it. All right, number nine. Number nine seems like it might be a trick question, but it's really a matter of finding the area between two curves. It's just one of them is kind of hidden as a curve. You don't really necessarily at first glance think of, and I'll highlight it here. I'll, put a, I'll make it a little thicker so it stands out. This line with with the height that appears to be, at first glance, one half. I'm just gonna go for it and call it y equals one half. All right, 
I'm not taking a guess. There's a good reason for it. But we'll get to that in a second. Um, yeah, so we're looking for the area between two curves, because one of those curves happens to be a horizontal line. Right. Oh, it was like right there. I had it. Tripped at the finish line. But the Mets won again today. So can't get too upset. Again, Yankees always win. So there's no joy when they win. It's just expected. It's like the A student that comes home with an A on a test. I'm like, well, you always get an A. It's when that student who normally fails comes home with an A. And it's like you throw a parade. Yeah, that's the Mets right there. So, so yeah, basically, I could screw up this entire lesson and I'm going to be happy. It doesn't even matter because the Mets won four in a row. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to find the area between these two curves. So the first question I think that would be on some of our minds would be how did I know that that was y equals one half aside from looking at the height and saying, well, it looks like it's halfway between zero and one. And then you would say, well, maybe it's a trick question. Maybe it's like 0.47 or 0.53. Again, I'm, I'm not into trick questions. If it looks like it's a half, it's a half. If it looks like it's three quarters, it's not 0.78, it's three quarters, you know? So, but there's an, there's, a methodical way to figure this out. And these intersection points fall on the curve y equals the sine of x. All right. So y equals the sine of x, and this guy here, and I'll just kind of do it like that, would be x equals 5 pi over 6. All right. So this point. This guy right here is going to have an x value of 5 pi over 6 and a y value of the sine of 5 pi over 6. Fun fact, sine of 5 pi over 6 is equal to 1 half. All right, I could do the same thing on the other side. It's just that it would get too messy, so I'm not. But it would work the same way, pi over 6 comma, sine of pi over 6, result 1 half. All right. Unit circle. Unit circle values. All right. If you eyeball it, you get lucky. That's fine. All right. There's no harm in that. But if you know your unit circle values, you can at least be confident going into the remainder of the question that you didn't just botch the whole thing up. All right. Now, the bounded region is happening over the interval of pi over 6 to 5 pi over 6. And it's going to be the difference between the dominant function sine of x and the non-dominant function 1 half, y equals 1 half, dx. If you had to do it by hand, it's not terrible. The antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. Antiderivative of negative 1 half is negative 1 half x, plug and chug. But again, not something you need to do by hand, so don't waste your time. Right. And we didn't even do uh, we didn't even do u substitution in this unit. You know, we didn't even do like like the next level. I mean, in Calc one, it, for the for the folks who were able to actually get to some integration, you usually get to like the basic rules and then a little bit more. And that little bit more usually ends up being used substitution, maybe another type of substitution. So, I mean, they're, they're like, what am I assessing by making you do this by hand? Nothing, all right? So fight the urge on the test. I know like 99% of the class, if that even makes sense mathematically based on the number of students here, 99% of the class is not even considering, considering doing it by hand. But there's like that 1% that's just gonna instinctively start doing it by hand and they won't be able to stop themselves yeah you just got to have to train yourself you got to think to yourself am i making the most effective use of my time all right you don't have unlimited time for tests so you're going to find yourself out of time if you start 
doing things that you're not supposed to do. These questions don't even ask you to integrate. Oh, well, the directions are on the previous page, but they don't even ask you to integrate. So the thought shouldn't even cross your mind. But if they did ask you for the actual area, it goes into the calculator, math nine, type it in, hit enter. The only thing you gotta worry about for this particular question is that your calculator needs to be in radian mode, all right? And so you might say, well, I'll just, I'll just change my bounds to degrees and put it in degree mode. It's not gonna work, it's not gonna work because what happens is radian, radian forms of trig functions, they linearize the trig function, all right? So what they do is they take the trig function and they put it in linear units. Right, so you can, instead of looking at an angle as a degree measure, you actually look at it as a distance. All right, that can be measured in inches or feet or miles or whatever. All right, so what it does is it, it, it essentially standardizes it. So the one half is gonna be in inches, feet, or miles. All right, that sine of x also needs to be in inches, feet, or miles. It's an arc, all right? So it's an actual linear distance. Radians allows for that to happen, degrees do not. Right, so you'll have an inconsistency with units, and you'll stare at my answer key when you get it after the test, and you'll stare at your work, and you'll try desperately to figure out how you lost credit, aka how you got a different answer. All right, so radian mode. Honestly, check your calculator right now, hit the mode key, make sure it says radian. There's no reason in this entire unit, um, let me see, in this entire course just making sure that I'm not lying no 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 there is not a single moment in this course where you will need to be in degree mode all right in calc 3 you're going to bounce back and forth between radian and degree mode that'll be annoying but in this course you will be exclusively in radian mode you'll never have to go to degree mode all right, so put it in radian mode. It'll be annoying if you're taking a physics class at the same time because they tell you the exact opposite, right? That's troublesome. But I just got through teaching a, um, a physics teacher how to, while being in radian mode, still have your calculator accept degrees. And so his response to me is, okay, so tell your students to put their calculators in degree mode and teach them how to have their calculators accept values in radian mode. So we got into a little bit of an argument, but I'm right, so I don't know why we're arguing. Uh, so anyway, number 11 is one of those situations where you wanna change your perspective, all right? If you, well, I mean, I don't wanna speak for you. If I were you, I would wanna change my perspective, but you might say, well, I can figure out this area and still use a DX. But my response to that is, but I can do it much quicker. And efficiency is part of the game. About 20 years ago, when I first started teaching, there was this big push to uh, let the students do it any way they want. As long as they get the right answer, if it makes sense to them, it's fine. And then what was happening is, people were taking like an hour and a half on one problem because they were doing it their way. And eventually they get the right answer, but it was not an efficient approach. So then it morphed into, okay, now that you can get an answer, let's see if we can find a better way to get the answer, all right? So you can do it with the DX, you can get a good answer, let's say, or get a good solution. Let's see if we can get a better solution. A better solution is when we change our perspective and make our arbitrary rectangle perpendicular to the y-axis, all right? So I'd have a thickness dy corresponding with a distance x. And I mentioned yesterday that you could write x of y if you think that'll make life a little easier, all right? The area of this rectangle is x times dy. If I integrate all those, integrate all my x dy's, over the interval of negative nine to three, I'll have it, but I have to have consistency in my variable, so that x has to go. So I'm gonna solve this. It doesn't have to be pretty, because again, you're using your calculator, all right? So I'm gonna solve this equation for x in terms of y. 
So I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna bring that over and swap it with the y and then divide by three and take the square root. So three minus y over three under the square root. Hopefully I did that right. Let me just double check. I'm gonna put my leg up if this thing's here. Do the uh, Captain Morgan. Let's see. I'm gonna switch a rooski. Well, if I move this bad boy to the other side, it becomes positive. Okay. Oh. And then I made that one negative. The Y became negative. Yeah. So I think it's good. If I went the other way, it would be. Yeah. And so you could get that. You could get Y minus 3 over negative 3 under the root, in which case you have the same thing. All right, so either way, we're good. So my nib ripped. integral will get you to the promised land. Um, although that doesn't really look like much of a negative in front of that 9. Negative by it. Now, again, it, it's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of requirement, depending on the situation. If I had to do this by hand, I don't know, do I want to do it this way or the other way? I know, because the other way I get to work with a polynomial function, reverse power rule, and it's probably its easiest form, one of its easiest forms. This way, yeah, it's still going to be not too bad, but you have to get a little little baby U substitution in there. All right, so uh, I'll explain what that means in the next unit, but it's U substitution without, without going too crazy, you know. Um, yeah, so I probably lean towards keeping it in terms of x, but because I have technology at my disposal, aka I'm allowed to use it, I'd be more inclined to do it this way. All right, and so that's one of the challenges that you might face moving forward once you, once you leave my class. But while you're in my class, calculator is a good thing.